Hey, what's up everybody? It's Michael Geddes here. I am very excited to do my top 10 list of comic books that I own in my collection today. Yeah, I've been watching other YouTubers do the same format and it inspired me to go ahead and show you what my top 10 are. Full disclosure, I got to my top 10 and had to throw in another one. So there's an honorable, honorable mention that I just couldn't figure out um, if, if it was going to be in the collection or not. So um, without further ado, uh, the, <laughs> okay, so maybe it's top 12-ish. So a lot of the books in my collection, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the books in this run are going to represent, you know, collections that I have. And these are kind of my favorites of those collections. But one collection I own almost the entire run, um, like not just the entire run, but like, the Fantagraphics, Yasagi Ojimbo, Stan Sakai. I own the Mirage, and then I almost, I think I own the entire Dark Horse, almost. I, mean, I think we're 1 through 100. So, um, and then also, all the Space Yasagis and all the color specials. Really, the favorite out of the run is the Space Yasagi. Um, Stan Sakai is the most incredible comic writer, in my own humble opinion. Um, he could seriously go on forever with this character. I was introduced to him through the Ninja Turtles. I actually have my own little homage to Yoisagi Ujimbo here from the Ninja Turtles run, which I repainted. This is uh, my own interpret. This is the black Yoisagi Ujimbo. Um, but yeah, I actually painted that one myself. But I have the regular one. It's actually in my two-year-old's room from the original 1988 run. But uh, Yoisagi Ujimbo, definitely one of my favorites. Um, and I got this all, I got this collection all at the same time. I got it at a yard sale for $25 for basically the whole thing and started reading it. I was going to try to sell it and I started reading it and I was like, heck no, this is one of my favorite books. This is actually Yosagi Ojimbo number one from the Fantagraphics run. And this is the second print. Um, also amazing. It doesn't really matter to me. Second print's still worth 50, 50 bucks, I guess, nowadays. When I first found it, it was like a $200 book, which was crazy, because he was coming out of the, his Netflix special was coming out, or his Netflix cartoon was coming out. Don't watch the net. I mean, well, the Netflix cartoon is pretty bad, so um, in my own humble opinion, I mean, if you feel differently, um, you know, sorry to step on your toes, but it, it wasn't a good, wasn't a good experience and didn't really correlate really, really well with the character, so... Uh, if they would have just done what he did in the comic, it would have been great, but they didn't. So uh, they just made some mishmash of a bunch of other ideas, or I don't know. So that's number one, Space Yosagi number one, definitely. Um, but the Yosagi Ojimbo collection, one of my faves. Uh, the second book in my collection, I don't own a lot of Superman, but I found a big stack of Golden Age comic books it wasn't a big stack. It was like 12 Golden Age comic books. This was the reason why I went and grabbed them. Um, this is uh, uh, Mixie Plex. He's, in, he's the, the, the villain. Not the first appearance of him. Just a really cool um, early Silver Age book. It's got the code on it. Number 96, Superman. Um, got to, you know, I've read this one, of course, a couple times. It's really, really pretty cool. It's really campy and... <laughs> Just so different from comic books nowadays. And um, it's not in great condition, really. I mean, it's got a lot of wear and it's, I probably wouldn't even really take it out of the, out of the bag these days. Um, but every time I'm just going through my comic collection, I always see this book and I just say, well, I'm really glad I owned that and I didn't sell it because I sold pretty much everything else out of that run. I sold like um, a world's finest, like 64. And I was so torn about selling that World's Finest 64 because I loved it so much. But, like, there's certain books that I own as well as, like, that I sell that I just feel like I may be the last owner of this book. And, you know, if I'm not really interested in, in, in if, if it's something that doesn't really fit my collection, typically I'll kind of sell it off. But this is the one out of that that I kept. I just couldn't get rid of it. Um, but, yeah, definitely a cool book. And glad I own it. I'm glad I kept it. So next up, this is one that you're not going to see on a lot of top 10 lists. Um, this is uh, the Uncanny X-Force number one. And this is a Rick Remender book. 
um, back from 2014. And this book, uh, it doesn't have a lot of significant value. As a matter of fact, you could probably pick this up for, you know, five, ten bucks. Um, but this is the book that, and I own the entire run of this too, so this just represents that run. But um, this is the book that got me back into comics after a very, very long, maybe just picking up, you know, random books here and there in antique shops. This is the one that, that got me like full steam back into collecting and reading and just enjoying. And the art I think was amazing. And it was my first real introduction to the modern Deadpool, which was a big was a big part of my love for this this run. And Remender did just an amazing job writing for him and you know, his sense of humor. Um the, the you know, the gray and the black color scheme hooked me in. Um, the team was just the best choice. Like all these characters, like Deadpool, you know, m amazing character. You got Wolverine, you know, I own a lot of Wolverine comics. So he's another one that, that I'm hooked into, you know, um, I loved Archangel's character design and to have him in a book where he's a little bit of an anti-hero is a real, was really appealing. Psylocke, you know, just amazing character. And then we got this guy who I had no exposure to up until this run. But, you know, after this, you know, I, I thought Phantom X was amazing. Like, I hope they bring him back and start using him. I hope he shows up in the MCU. Um, but this team to me, this is, this and the read and the, the, especially one through four, like that, that run, like, it doesn't get any better than that. So if you haven't read this, go out and read it. Um, it's, it's worth collecting just, you know, just, to, just for the art alone. I mean, wow. So yeah, Uncanny X-Force number one, I'd say one through four. Um, I love EC. Entertainment Comics. Uh, this is Mad Magazine number seven. And this is a very, I, most of my Golden Age comics are in lower grade, unfortunately, because I don't have the money to pay for high grade Golden Age comics. Uh, I bought this for my birthday last year. Um, this is number seven. Um, again, a lower grade copy. Cover's still attached. Um, Harvey Kurtz and cover. Um, and this is just before it, Mad Magazine was even, a, you know, a, a, a publication as a magazine. It was, this is the Mad the Comic. Um, and if you don't know the history, EC started off printing Mad. And then um, once the once the comic code came out, you know, they, they kind of got around that whole idea by going to the magazine publications and it just hooked into a larger audience and it didn't quite have the stigma on it that comic books had because at this point in time, you know, this is pre-code, right? So, um, you know, mothers and fathers didn't want their kids to be having comic books because that was, that, that's how, uh, that's how you got bad grades in school, right? So, uh, so yeah, that's the origin. And, you know, Harvey Kurtzman was a, was the primary writer for a long time. Um, and I think he took over for, from, um, for, I think he started mad from, from, uh, front, frontline combat and two fisted tales, I think were his books, but, uh, just really fun books. I mean, it's got the Sherlock Holmes mystery here, which is great. And, um, there's nothing better than the art in Mad Magazine. And this is one of two, I have, I think 14 with the Mona Lisa cover. Um, I love that one too. I think, but I think out of the two, I think this is the reason why I grabbed I grabbed the pair. Grabbed the pair online a while back. Got a great deal on them. Um, Mad Magazine number seven, EC Comics. I'm really glad I own this comic. All right, so the next one is another EC comic. And this one, I actually laid it over here because I had to take it out of the wrapper. Um, this, is, this is not anything anybody's ever going to jump up and down about at this point in time. I might be wrong if you're looking at this video in three years. And suddenly, frontline combat becomes the big the big thing. All right. So again, in collections, I own most of the frontline combat run. Right. I think I own like two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, or something like that. Maybe even up to fifteen. I can't remember. But got them all in the same collection. Didn't really realize what they were. Honestly, um, this is a Jack Davis cover. And this is one of the lower grade ones. You can see like there's some, I guess, water damage that happened to it because you can see that there's some spots on the side here. It's in pretty nice shape overall. Um, this actually is not the most remarkable one out of the bunch. 
except for one thing. And EC Comic Fan, right? So one night I'm going through this and I flip to this page and I saw there's writing on the bottom of it. And I'm like, who, what kid, you know, cause usually people, people would doodle a lot on these older books and draw and sign their name. Usually they'd sign their name like right here to, you know, so the neighborhood kid wouldn't gank their book. <laughs> but one night I'm just like going through this. I'm really not engaged in war stories very much. I, I do want to go back and read some of these again, just because um, I do have a different perspective on them now, knowing that a lot of the, a lot of the, the cool part about EC War Stories is that the, I think, I can't remember who it was. I think Harvey Kurtzman, but I think he was a, a, a war vet, but he would actually, um, he would actually write war stories that didn't glamorize war. Like he would show like the nitty gritty um, reality, you know, that w what would happen is, is, you know, as a soldier which I guess that's what made them so provocative. So I need to go back and read it. But so I was like, who, who signed their book on the inside of here? You know, George Evans. I'm like, why did, the, why did George Evans, the six year old sign? And I'm like, wait a minute, George Evans, I recognize that name. Yeah, so George Evans is actually the artist on this specific page or this specific story. So unlike back in the day, I guess in 1996, when you, you know, got met George Evans, George Evans didn't sign the cover like they do now, he signed it where his story was in the book, right? Because they do different stories in EC. Usually you get three or four stories um, throughout the book, kind of like Mad Magazine in a way. But so George Evans is the artist on this. And if you don't recognize George Evans as an artist, I mean, he did the iconic, like, um, he did the, he, he was the artist on Crime Suspense, uh, Crime Suspense Stories 22 with, you know, the, the, the iconic, like, lopped off lady's head you know, with her eyes rolled up into her skull. He's that artist, right? So I mean, yeah, so I got a George Evans signed Frontline Combat. George Evans passed away many, many years ago. So that's, that's you know, it's a good conversation piece. It's an amazing book. It's Jack Evans art. It's George Evans signature. Just so many, I'll never, I mean, I'll never sell this, right? Unless somebody's like a diehard George Evans fan. I will say I did own Crime Suspense Story number 22 when I got this run. I mean, I had like tons of EC comics and like an idiot, I just popped right on eBay and sold it for, I think like 800 bucks at the time. It was a big mistake. I should have never sold that comic. I should have just kept it. So moving on, cause there's always one rule I've always noticed about comics. There's always more comics, right? So, and granted it won't ever probably be a crime suspense story 22. There's always comics. Next up is a comic that I got to hold when I was a little kid. Uh, I think, I, well, maybe not a little kid, maybe an 11, 12 year old, you know. And I really wanted it, right? And it was some guy who picked it up like at a garage sale for a dollar probably. And I never saw another copy of this until the guy online was selling it. And I got it for a great price, even, in, even with today's market. You've probably seen me show this thing off before, but this is X-Men number 12. Um, it's maybe like a 3-0 on a good day. You know, if the if the grader, you know, is uh, is not going through a, a terrible divorce at CGC, it might be worth, you know, a 3-0. Um, first appearance of the Juggernaut. Um, pretty decent shape, got all the staples. Um, beautiful red cover, I always, kind of have a joke that, you know, I'm really, if, if it's a red comic, I'll buy it and kind of notice a lot of the random comics that I buy have red covers. So, um, it's also an amazing story. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't, I, I've thought about encapsulating this a few times. It's a major key, but the problem is, is that it's Jack Kirby art, right? I mean, it's unmistakably Jack Kirby art and the cover's great. But if you have ever read the story, I mean, it's like a slasher film, you know, or it's just like a monster. They, they write it like a monster movie because you don't see his face. He's just coming through like all these obstacles and beating down walls and getting through traps. So um, yeah, I mean, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby just really nailed it in this. Um, I would never ca encapsulate this just because I, I will read this again and enjoy it. Even though I could probably read it online, there's just nothing like reading it in the raw. In, in the flesh, there it is, X-Men number 12. And I think this is 1965, 1965 or 1966. Next up is 1980, 
um, another X-Men book. And this one is an interesting story because I think I may have gotten like a check for $50 from um, my, my like grandmother-in-law. And I was like, I don't know what to do with this. So I just went online and bought a copy of the Uncanny X-Men 141. 50 bucks, right? Wouldn't that be great? So I got it in the mail, and I'm thinking it's going to be a you know a decent mid-grade copy based on the pictures. Then I start checking this thing out, and I'm like, well, there's two spine ticks. You can you might even be able to see them. Two two spine ticks, but I'm like, that thing is crisp. That thing is sharp. Um, there's really no flaws in it. There's a little bit of print rub on the back, but I think they they're pretty forgiving of that typically. But yeah, they gave me a 9.6 on it. I got it graded. Don't regret it. Um, I mean, I don't like to encapsulate books. And again, this is a great read. I have read it quite a bit. But when you have a book from 1980 that's an iconic cover, um, from an iconic run of the Byrne, you know, the Byrne Austin um, art, and then the the Chris Claremont stories. And then it also, I mean, by the way, it's a first appearance of... Phoenix Dew, Avalanche, Destiny, Pyro. I mean, there's a lot of first appearances for the X-Men in here. So, yeah, I bit the bullet and had it graded. And I don't really regret it because, you know, this book, this book in high grade goes for a pretty decent amount of money. But it's also, you know, it's also just a really cool book. Um, yeah, and this is another one. I, You know, I've, I've actually thought about selling it. I've actually had it online to sell, but I always priced it really high because I'm like... Uh, this is one of my favorite books, so probably won't ever part with it. Who knows? Maybe for the right price, I'll do it. It's like the, the old joke: my my truck is always for sale for the right price. But I don't know. It had to be a pretty pretty right price. So we'll, we're going to go back to the vein of EC one last time, and I'll promise I'll stop if you're a Golden Age horror fan. Um, you know. I get it. A lot of people don't like EC, and I kind of bounce between superhero and horror a lot, but um, this next book is um, the last of the crime suspense story books that I own that I regret selling. <laughs> but uh, this, the, it's really interesting because this is actually a George Evans cover, right? So it kind of couples well with the signature. Um, this was the worst condition book in the run, and it had this big chew, you know, this big, big uh, chew, basically. I don't know what happened there, but it's pretty nasty. Um, not in terrible condition, but the, I don't think you can see it, but the cover is detached. Um, so it's kind of like still splitting because it's just falling apart. So another book that probably won't ever come out of the bag, unfortunately. I think I did take this one out recently and read it. I loved it. It was so awesome. These stories are amazing. Um, this story that... This guy chops this guy up, and um, I'm trying to remember what happened exactly. But th there's always this little twist at the end of the stories, which is the best part. I, I can't remember what the twist was in this, but yeah. But another book that I'm just glad I didn't sell. I was actually, I actually sold this book to somebody up in Pennsylvania, and they were just being so neurotic about like packaging and just like nitpicking. And I was like, you know what, dude, like, I'm just going to let you have your money back. I'm not really interested. And he's like, well, no, 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 sell it to me. Sell it to me. I'm like, you know, I think I'm just going to hang on to it. It was the last one. And I was like, I was already starting to regret selling the crime Sin story 22. And I was like, I think I'll just hang on to this for a trophy. And I, don't regret it. I'm never going to sell this book. I am the last owner of this book. It's going to fall apart. Probably, you know, my kids will find this one day or their their grandkids or whatever, and there'll be like a little bag of book dust in the bottom of it. So final owner, crime suspense story number 24. And no, it's not for sale. And for the right price, I will not sell it to you because I'll never see it again if I do. So one of my favorites. So we're down to the top two. The next one is one that you probably see on everybody's top 10 list, but for me, it's a little different because um, mine actually is a little bit sen sentimental to me because um, my, when my grandmother died, she was completely penniless. 
like no inheritance to really give. And I basically got 200 and I think it was $210. And I was like, I'm going to commemorate my grandmother, right? Drinking my liquid death here. So I went out and bought this just with the, with the, all the money that she gave me for inheritance. And I, I think in terms of like commemorating something or someone with 200, I guess $10 that I got, I think I made a good decision because I'm never going to probably give this one up, but this is my copy of New Mutants 98. Um, again, a representation of a lot of other New Mutants books I have. I love the New Mutants run. I think I have one through 21 and then I think I skip a bunch and then it's like 97 through 100 and then X-Force, you know, so uh, I don't have the middle run because I've only heard bad things about it, but I probably will wind up getting it. So this is an 8.5 white pages. Um, first appearance of Deadpool, obviously, probably don't even need to say it. It's also first appearance of the fake Domino and, and Gideon. Copycat, that's her name. Also, it, it, it showcases um, one of my favorite pieces about this book, which is, uh, you know, Rob Liefeld um, dismantling this team one by one. Um you know, getting rid of a lot of the characters that he didn't like and introducing characters that he did like. Um, so, you know, Richter leaves the team. He didn't like Richter's character character design. You know, he kept Cannonball. Um, he dumps... Uh, he dumps... Surprisingly, I always really enjoyed Sunspot, his uh, his character design, but he dumps him in the next issue. Um, especially when he, you know, when he turns into his mutant power and he's got the black silhouette. I mean, it's just amazing. But, you know, Domino, what an amazing character. Gideon, I don't think they liked Gideon. I don't remember why, but he he didn't really make it. He didn't make it in the, Mar in the Marvel Universe at all. But Cable, and then, you know, the Cannonball redesign was genius. I, I just loved what he did with Cannonball and Boom Boom. So, yeah, that's New Mutants 98. Um, definitely one of my favorites. More so probably because of the, you know, my grandmother kind of like willed it to me in her, her, her last her last will and testament kind of you know but uh you know i it's, it's worth every bit of an 8.5 if i cracked it and did it again it'd probably probably get an eight really there's just a couple of spine ticks and flaws so i'll take it think about an, an 8.5 that's nice too it's not really resellable it's it is what it is you know it, it's not the 9.8 where you're Ah, you know, maybe I'll maybe I'll take that two thousand bucks when it's at its high, or the nine six where you know you can still get five hundred for it, but nine eight five, nah, nobody's gonna want that, you know. That's mine. All right, so I got the runner up. Speaking of mine, books that nobody else would probably really ever want. I mean, maybe I don't know, but I this this is one I recently acquired and showed off. I'm sure if you watch my channel, you've seen me show it off before. But uh, yeah, I opened up a, a, a CGC a, on, on film of a buddy of mine, Chuck's, a couple weeks ago. And um, this is kind of the honorable mention, but it's the .5 of the Fantastic 449, first appearance of uh, Galactus. Um, it's a Jack Kirby cover again. Um, it's, it's, it's a restored cover. It's also off-white. It's got like everything possibly wrong to it, except I don't know if you can see it, but that's the best looking .5 restored cover that I've ever seen. So I... I just I just grabbed it. I paid. He he gave me a pretty decent deal on it. it and again, like nobody's ever gonna want it. But hey, I got a copy of Fantastic Four Forty Nine. So what? So what if it's a point five? At least I can enjoy it. It's a good wall book. You know, people come over. It's a good conversation piece. So, yep, runner up. Didn't know where it really fits in with there, but um, definitely one that I I love and will keep. And the last one is not a comic book at all, so I don't really know if it even qualifies here. But going back to the conversation earlier that we talked about with um, magazines, right? So when all the comic book um, publishers got um, the comic book code, the way to get around it was to turn it into a magazine. So a lot of them migrated into magazines, right? And 
this one actually took a lot of the artists that were existing inside of EC and pulled it into um, the Warren publications. And this is my favorite of the Warrens, the biggest book that I probably own from Warren. I have a lot of Warren at this point, a lot of Vampirilla, but uh, this is Vampirilla number one, uh, September 1968. And uh, this is also a Frank uh, Frazetta cover. Um, a lot of people don't really understand this about Vampirilla, but she's actually a horror host. So um, as you're going through it, like the whole thing isn't about Vampirilla. It's about like different horror stories, just like EC, you know, so you start with a little Vampirilla thing and then the next story she introduces the, you know, she's the, she's the host. I mean, she tells you about what's going to happen or what, you know, she does the foreshadowing thing, kind of like, uh, kind of like the old witch, you know, um, but the reason why I think this is one of my favorite, this is my favorite comic. I mean, it is my favorite collected magazine slash comic that I own. Um, and I'll be really honest with you. I really don't know why, but this is the one that I think every time I talk to somebody about comics, I bring it up. Or um, every time I think about what's my favorite comic in my head, this is the one I see. Um, the art is amazing inside. I've thought about enca encapsulating this as well. Um, it's not that great of condition. It's probably a 5.0, so it's nothing that, you know, can't be touched. Like, there's already flaws. There's spine ticks. There's, I think there's even a little rub here. So, um, a lot of this for me is like, um, you know, if it's going to be a 9.8, I'll probably get it graded. But this is every day of a 5.0. So, you know, it's still, you know, it's still, you know, an 8, maybe a, maybe six to $800 book, depending on the day. It was worth way more a while back. There's no movie on her. So, you know... It's, it's kind of a grail when it, in terms of, you know, horror host, horror comics. Um, I think I paid 25 cents for this book. You know, I'll, maybe not even that. I mean, I think Crime Suspense Stories paid for this book in itself just because of the lot that I picked it up in. But this was in that same lot as Crime Suspense. And um, this is one of the reasons I was going through the collection. This is one of the books that I actually had in my hands because I was going to buy them individually. And then, you know, I just popped on, just, I just asked him how much he would take for the full lot and got, got the whole thing. So I've got this one, I've got Vampirilla 2, you know, I've got Skip 3 because it was a low print run, 4, um, 12, you know, a lot of those. And ugh, I just love the whole thing. And I collect them too. If I see new ones that I don't have, I'm, you know, I'm trying to get them. So, but that's pretty much it. This is my favorite comic. No questions asked. Go figure. I never thought I'd be a Vampirilla collector, but I, there you go. Um, I appreciate you all watching. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did going through my favorite books. It really gave me a rush. Like, follow, subscribe. Um, come back pretty soon. We're going to have a uh, unboxing for CGC. I've got some coming. <laughs> I put them in the mail the other day. <laughs> Haven't even checked to really see if they made it yet. Not really, not really too enthusiastic about encapsulating books these days, but... You know, it'll be fun to open them up. They're a couple of Wolverine books and X-Force and stuff like that, stuff I like. So anyway, and then come back again. Chuck and, uh, Chuck and I are going to unbox another CGC unboxing. And from what I understand, it sounds like it's going to be pretty dramatic because uh, there's going to be some surprises in there that uh, I don't even think him or, him or I agree with the grade. And it's not a bad grade. So stay tuned. Um, that will be coming, I think, this weekend. Some, maybe Saturday or Sunday. But enjoy the rest of your week, and we'll see you soon.